cynicism is definitely a form of cowardice. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 16 of the Spotlight Podcast, Success Stories for Veterans, where it is our job to break down and analyze titans from both the military and civilian communities to break down their mindset, their tactics, and their strategies so that you can take those and apply them to your life and ultimately your transition. Those titans range from New York Times bestselling authors to former heads of state to other divergent thinkers who are out there dominating their field by challenging conventional wisdom. Today, we are interviewing Benjamin Asari. Now, Benjamin is currently in the Army JAG Corps, and the Army sent him to go to law school. And during his time there, he absolutely dominated so much so that when I arrived in the same campus, people were still talking about him, even though he wasn't there. Every time somebody was having a conversation about the military or veterans, Ben's name was coming up. So after talking with people, I realized this is somebody I needed to meet. And he was ultimately the person who inspired this podcast. So how does somebody have an impact and a mindset like that? Listen and find out. Catch, catch me up for, for, for people on the podcast who are going to be listening to this who may not know your background. Just give me the breakdown of everything yeah, you've done. Yeah, so um, I guess we'll just start from the beginning. So originally from Sacramento, California. Um, went to uh, first grade through high school in Sacramento. I went to uh, United States Military Academy at West Point for my undergraduate studies. I graduated in 2011. I was commissioned as an air defense officer in the United States Army. We stationed in Korea, JBLM, Fort Bliss. Uh, I got a unique opportunity to attend law school on the Army's dime. Uh, and that was my transition on the civilian side for three years. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I attended Gonzaga Law School, graduated in 2018. Uh, then went, uh, I was still active duty during that time period, but I got to be a civilian for those three years. And uh, as soon as I graduated law school, passed the Washington State Bar, I entered the JAG Corps, and I've been mm -hmm. in the JAG Corps, United States Army JAG Corps, for uh, exactly a year, coming on the one-year anniversary. Yeah, and what was what was crazy to me about that whole story is I had, I was, and one of the main reasons I invited you on is because I kept hearing about you from people <laughs> all over the school, and you'd be gone. They're like, "Oh, do you know this guy Ben? You know this guy Ben?" Multiple people kept <laughs> talking about you. I was like, "Okay, this guy has done something right because people keep saying his name." It's not, it's very rare that I find myself in a situation where somebody's just like, you got to meet this guy or you got to know about this guy. You should shoot him <laughs> an email. And I was like, oh my goodness. And then I started looking into it and you had started the podcast Spotlight, which is actually what this is. You were the, you were the one who inspired this. So talk to me about being in the military and then dropping into law school <laughs> Because I, I don't know that people really can appreciate how ridiculous of a of a duality that is. And then while being in law school, deciding to start a podcast, you know, just break down those three years for me because I'm fascinated. I have to know. Oh, absolutely. So, so the way I kind of look at it, Carson, and again, thanks very much for having me on the show. Um, I would say that you've, you've taken this show uh, – to a level that I never had. So, I mean, just the diligence, the technology. Uh, so, uh, kudos to you. <laughs> oh, thank you. You uh, gave me the confidence it, to do it, man. I was like, well, if he just sat down and did it, that's all, that's what it comes down to. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, I think what I look to is, you know, I had a very unique undergrad experience, you know, going to, uh, you know, West Point, I was always just like, get out of that school, right? Like you graduate, like you do the best job that you can. Um, there wasn't very much room, or at least I thought during that time period, there wasn't very much room to explore in these different extracurricular activities. Uh, it was, you know, do a good job, commission and, and drive on. Uh, and then as soon as I graduated, you know, West Point, I looked back and I was like, man, they offered so many opportunities and so many experiences that I just, uh, in a sense, overlooked because I was just focusing on graduating and doing a good job in my academics. So when I got to law school, it was almost as if I was given a second chance, yeah. uh, a second chance to explore <laughs> and uh, engage in activities that I've always wanted to do. And I think just that experience that I had in the military between 
graduation and getting opportunity to go to law school is a short time period, about four years. But just the work ethic that I was able to develop from mentors that I worked with um, allowed me to approach law school in a very guess, streamlined, focused mindset, knowing that, hey, like I'm here to do a mission. Uh, I'm here to, you know, the Army's sending me here, so I'm here to do the best job that I possibly can and be able to essentially allow the Army to get a return on their investment. So that was my mindset, and I think that's what allowed me to focus on the academic piece. And then, again, looking back at my experience from the academy, I said, well, I want to be able to explore in these extracurricular activities. And this podcast was presented my second year of law school. Uh, I had a professor, Professor Stephen Sepanek. I believe he's still at the, uh, at the law school. Yes, he is. And I had him as a, uh, in my transactional skills class. And he said to me one day, you know, it was before class, he said, hey, have you ever considered doing radio? And my response to him was, yeah, I mean, I guess, like, in a, <laughs> in a very, like, pipe dream type of sense. And he said, hey, I think you'd be great at it. And lo and behold, maybe two or three weeks later, I saw an announcement at Gonzaga through their student activities that a podcast was available for a student to host. And, you know, I'm a... A man of faith in the sense so I, and I prayed about it I shared it with my parents my sister and they said go for it I went for it and and that's how the story came about so tell me about so you're going through this and now you decided you want to start hooking and jabbing with a podcast how did you approach kind of that initial outreach and get the momentum going for the podcast for spotlight yeah, yeah. so this was very new terrain for me I never did college radio uh, I've only listened to the radio uh, as a kid. Fresh Air, WHYY with Terry Grace was one of the big shows that my dad used to listen to. Um, so I wanted to frame the podcast in that type of uh, sense, a question and answer on unique topics that some people have an idea of, but they just don't have like an in-depth knowledge of, me, myself included. So what I did is I sent, in a sense, wrote out a syllabus saying, hey, these are the 10 or 12 subjects that I think individuals, uh, we have conversations about, um, but there's just a lack of like in-depth conversations. It, it, it always just does wave top conversations on these subjects, yeah. but I think it'd be good if undergrads and graduate students alike were able to dig deeper. So in writing out these topics, you know, electoral college, uh, criminal procedures from a police perspective, from a citizen's perspective, um, subjects like that, I reached out to professors. I mean, being at the law school, you have a wealth of resources, not just the professors being the, um, uh, the guests on the show, but they could also point you to people that mm -hmm. they know are very much learned in that environment. So it was much of, it was really just a personal interaction that I had with people saying, Hey, I have this podcast. Uh, this is a show that I'm, I'm thinking of. These are some questions that I plan on asking. This is the message that, I'm attempting to convey, but through your own words, uh, would you be willing to come on the show? And more, th more times than not, I don't think anybody ever said no. Everybody was like, absolutely, yeah. it'll be fun. And, and they went for it. Yeah, that's been my experience as well. If, if you frame it like, like, hey, you know, we're just trying to dig deeper on this and you approach it from like a, a curious-based mindset. Right. It, it, I, nobody's flat out, and certainly nobody has ever like, told me to go like, eat dirt. Or anything like that. If they're like, maybe not right now, I think is the worst answer. But it's like, you know, get to me in six months. Right. So, so you're breaking that down and, and you're pitching it. You know, come, what's going through your mind? How are you preparing that? And, did, you know, did you go through iterations? What did that look like? Right. So, this will start with the first, first episode that I, I had a guest on, an official guest, was uh, actually Professor Stephen Stepanek. And we talked about the Electoral College. And the approach of that was, I said, sir, you know, this is the subject matter that I want to uh, have a show on. And are you willing? He said, yes. Uh, we had a short conversation uh, so that I can kind of get a sense of what his background was in that specific subject. Yeah. Uh, and then trying to get a sense of what he was comfortable talking about. I mean, Electoral College, you're delving into politics. This was also in uh, 2017. Uh, just right after the most recent presidential election. 
So it was, it was ripe for a lot of um, emotions, regardless of whoever side, whatever party you're, you're, um, you're supporting. It's just the type of conversations are rife with emotions. And I wanted to make sure that that wasn't part of it. So I wanted to get a sense of like where the conversation is going to go. Uh, and Professor Stefanik um, is a consummate professional. So the conversation obviously never delved in that. And then once I got a sense of what his knowledge base was in that, um, I started jotting on questions that essentially reached back to the, to the information that he'd already provided me. And then once I had a sense of what those questions I wanted to ask him, I also did some research trying to answer those questions myself mm -hmm. um, so that I wasn't just oblivious to the answers that he was giving me so I could have some thought provoking follow up questions in the case that he answered a question that I had already uh, jotted down for him. Uh, and then I also wanted to make sure that I share those questions with him in advance, uh, just as you did, you know, maybe a week before, just so that he has time to prepare mm -hmm. um, and nothing would catch him off guard. And then I also just followed up by saying, you know, these are the anticipated questions. Uh, if there are any questions that will catch you off guard, please let me know. So I do not yeah. ask him. Uh, and, and he was uh, gracious enough to uh, acknowledge that. And I don't believe there are any questions that were going to catch him off guard. So that was the approach that I used for every, every guest. I had friends come on with the friends that came on. It was a little less formal. Uh, mm -hmm. They were just more comfortable with the um, just having a conversation. Uh, I had a good buddy of mine, uh, Phil Silcher. He's practicing right now in Spokane. Uh, and he was, one of his huge hobbies was, uh, and currently is, is in real estate uh, and buying homes, fixing them up and selling. And I think a lot of our generations, like we're, we're very much aware of that uh, business model, but in terms of the steps, what it takes to buy a house, to sell a house, uh, I just don't think there, there is a, there's a knowledge gap, I think, with some, some individuals. And he was just more comfortable having a conversation. He didn't want to go through the formalities uh, I shared the questions with him, but he said, Hey, I just, I just want to have a conversation. So you also just have to be aware of the, uh, the guests and what they're more comfortable with as well. Yeah. I, 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 I try to brief, brief that. So anybody else who out there is thinking about, uh, starting a podcast, I try to brief and people and be like, Hey, here's the, here's the, the limits. There's some things I don't want to talk about. Right. And there's some things that I'm just like, no, I don't. And I don't want you to talk about them. Exactly. That's just, and that's just reality. And I think that's important to establish those boundaries, but I also think it makes it a little bit more comfortable. Sure. So is, when you're talking about having your, your guests on and some of them are very formal and some of them are very informal, was there anything about that process that surprised you? The process of the interaction with the guests? Yeah. Just anything, anything strange that, that occurred in that process. You're like, Oh, uh, that was a learning point for me, whether good or bad. Yeah. So honestly, I think the, I think the biggest learning point was just navigating the technology um, mm -hmm. for me. That's, that's another side of the podcast that I'm sure you're experiencing. Um, the, the undergraduate uh, campus, Gonzaga University, they have a, a radio room and they have their own technology and they provide you a, a robust educational program on how to use that technology. And I was very much unfamiliar with that whole system. I've, I've never done radio. I've never done a podcast. And it was great to, uh, to be involved in that. And it gave you a lot of autonomy in that. Uh, but with a lot of autonomy comes a lot of mistakes. Yeah. So having never worked in this, uh, if you want to call it in, an industry, or even having this being a hobby, I, saw, I found myself needing to, if I was going to interview a guest for 30 minutes, I found myself having to come maybe an hour before the interview, making sure the technology was set up. Mm -hmm. Uh, prior to them coming because I didn't want them to be put out uh, of their own schedule. And then on the back end, it took time editing because they'll say things and then they'll say, oh, I actually don't want that to be part of it. Like, it wasn't a live, it wasn't a live podcast. So there are times when you had to be flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you were flexible and, and they did say something that they wanted to take back, you also had to be mindful of how to ed edit that out. Uh, and then make sure it sounded right when it came out. And then, you know, to the point that, that you raised, it's, it's so interesting when you're having a conversation with somebody and then you tell them, okay, now it's live. And then all of a sudden you notice that the body language changes. Yeah, like, oh, it does. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing different. I just, you know, I just said a word and I just, I clicked the record button, but 
I think I had to realize that there, there does, there is a, a responsibility on the host to almost put the guest at ease. Mm-hmm. And, and whether that's through body language, whether that's, you know, the, the, I wouldn't even call it a technique. I don't, I, I think that's just your personality, but just talking to the person before getting them comfortable as opposed to just hitting the record button right away without them, you know, yeah. being totally aware of the situation. Um, so there's little things that you just pick up that you're not going to know until you do a couple, couple reps and then you figure out, Oh wow. Like they were really nervous and then they calmed down. So how can I make them less nervous in the beginning? Yeah. And, and how do you, how do you go about putting people at ease? You know, I hear some people talk about body language, you know, some of them having conversations. Uh, is there like a, a surefire technique or do, what, what techniques do you prefer? Uh, I, I think the, I think the technique of having a conversation ahead of time. Um, so the technique I use is there was, there is a relationship before every show. So mm-hmm. before they came, we've had a conversation about what they're going to talk about at least two times. Mm-hmm. So, I, I knew that they were comfortable with the material and they were comfortable like talking with me in different settings. Um, so I think that was helpful. Uh, you know, I also dealt with law school professors, so they're just a unique breed. Like they're not, I don't think they're ever nervous, but, um, with my, with my friends and yeah, with my friends, I would come on who are less experienced in radio and just less experienced in, in that type of environment. Um, for them, I think I had to have a relationship specifically about what we're going to talk about a couple times. Mm-hmm. Um, I also would bring them into the, to the room, maybe two or three days before the actual show. And we'd actually do a, a rehearsal. Um, so I think just like that muscle memory for them was helpful. So when they actually did it, they had, you know, they'd been in the room, they visualized it. They knew the questions that were coming. Um, in terms of how I would situate myself, the way the room was set up, we were at a, at a table and we sat side by side each other. So I always try to make it a point to face my body towards them that I was fully engaged, making eye contact, uh, trying to stay away from uh, breaking away just so that they knew that I was listening, yeah, uh, and not trying to distract them and just letting them know that like besides the headset and everything else, we're really just having a conversation. And I think they got that sense. And that yeah. was a sure technique. I've noticed a huge difference when... when interviewing somebody like via different uh, over the internet versus yeah. putting them in that studio environment something about a studio environment puts people in like they're like oh this, it just seems so much bigger yeah. <laughs> of a deal when it's in there right so you've obviously done a lot of research on this topic whether it's understanding body language and understanding you know how to put people at ease it maybe some got some of that from law school but what resources do you really go to to help kind of frame your knowledge in this area of of body language and and yeah just whatever like what's what are your tomes what are your bible you know your the stuff that you really look to yeah Yeah. well uh yeah as i mentioned i mean i come from uh uh like a strong christian uh family so growing up in church the bible is always something that uh helps shape shape my perspective and my interactions with people um I would say leadership books. Uh, currently, right now in our in our office, uh, the JAG office, we have a professional development club uh, that specifically looks into um, how can you become better leaders. So, you know, some of the books that we read are, you know, Saber Generals. Um, Saber Generals is a phenomenal book that discusses uh, five generals who were facing dire situations. Uh, and how their leadership were able was able to, uh, in a sense, change the course of that culture, that change change the course of the events that that environment was experiencing. So they got into General Petraeus and the Iraq War. They came up with this counterinsurgency doctrine uh, during the surge, 2007 through 2009. Uh, they talk about General Sherman. Uh, they talk about General Ridgeway. Uh, in the Korean War. So in terms of uh, the type of books, I think it's always good just being in the military. It's always good to look at past leaders uh, to see some of the decisions that they made. Um, I, I guess a book outside of the military that I've always found very inspirational for many reasons and not necessarily in terms of um, uh 
I, I, I guess just, you know, coming from Hawaii or being here in Hawaii, um, being an African-American individual myself, uh, the novel Dreams for My Father is a book that I just uh, came across, not necessarily um, this past year. I read it maybe five or six years ago, but just the message of that book um, I ha has always just been, um, in a sense, very, very timely, uh, just at where I'm at in my life myself, right? Being an African-American individual uh, in the culture um, of any culture and, you know, being in Hawaii, kind of getting a sense of what the former president was dealing with during that time period. Um, that's also a book that has helped shape in some sense, my perspective um, currently where I'm at right now. How, and how has that impacted you? Was there any type of shift, maybe something that it reinforced or something that it, that it changed for you? Well, I think the, one of the themes that I got from that book, and I mean, everybody will have their own opinions on, on the message uh, of that book, but specifically from dreams from my father, I think it, it just made me more aware of, of who I was and, and how I fit into uh, the big picture. And I think everybody comes to that awareness in different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, for me during that time period, and I guess that just goes back to my own story being an African American. So my parents are from Ghana and I, I don't know if that was ever, uh, ever shared in the beginning or if, if that was made known. So my parents immigrated to this country from Ghana. So being a first generation, uh, American in California, in Northern California is, is just a very unique experience. It's a very diverse community. So I think growing up in that community, you never really see yourself, or at least I never saw myself as a minority in any sense, because you have all sorts of ethnicities there. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until I got older, I started becoming more aware of uh, the interactions between uh, different races, good, good and bad, right? Like I'm, I'm never, never writing off. Uh, I have, I've had, I don't think I've ever had a, a bad experience from, from any uh, ethnicity that was like tragic that other people have had to deal with. So that was just, and then, you know, also growing up in a Christian community, like it, it was almost like being like untouched in, in a sense and just being um, kind of like kept pure in that sense. Like, yeah, yeah everything, everything's great. What is everybody talking about? Right. Yeah. Uh, and then you read the book and then you, you just become more aware of how other people have viewed the world. Right. And I mm -hmm. think in a sense, I, I shared that perspective because uh, what the former president Obama wrote about was he had some somewhat of that experience coming from Hawaii, uh, which is a very, as, as you know, it's a very diverse community. Like you'll meet somebody yeah. and they'll, they'll be part Filipino, part Vietnamese, part Chinese. And it's just a conglomerate and it's just yeah. a, it's a beautiful thing to be around this type of environment. Mm -hmm. But what that book allowed me to see is um, where do you fit in the big picture? And like, how do you interact with people when you're in an area that you may in fact be the minority or you may in fact want to bring more people together? Um, so just having that like collective sense, that community sense that that book drew for me uh, was very informative. Has it, has it changed how you interact with people on a day-to-day -day basis? by internalizing that it did yeah i mean i think one of the one of the tenets of what i feel is is good leadership is just staying engaged and what i gathered from that book and other life experiences that i've had is people who are engaged in in even just like this the most simplistic forms right so it could just be checking in with somebody. It could just be, you know, making eye contact with somebody, hearing them out, listening to their story, asking them questions of, you know, like, you know, you're in the military. How many times did leaders ever ask like, Hey, where are you from? You know, like, yeah. how did you get into the military? Like we always just, sometimes we just start from where we see them and try to build that relationship, but we never really care too much about like, what do your parents do? Did you ever have parents in the military? And it sounds so simple and it sounds so basic and so obvious, but I think that is how you develop uh, in a sense of community. And that's how you develop and, and show people that you care about them. Um, interesting, in, in, interested in their background, interested in who they are, giving them the time uh, that each individual deserves. And I feel like the book, uh, that was one of the themes. That was one of the tenets in how you build a community. And, um, you know, I think that's just something that I, I was able to take from that book. 
Well, you know, it's it's interesting that you brought up the power of questions, right? And and giving people the room. And that's actually what I pulled from when I when I was listening to your podcast. And I was like, yeah, that's what I want to. That's the right target mix because that's what I actually broke down was how you did it. And the is there a, is there a question that you feel like has really been impactful or anything that you've learned about the art of questioning that you'd like to impart? That's a great question. (laughs) I would say that um, I think questions that allow people to, to speak, to talk, to, to get in a sense, their story and their message out. So open-ended questions, uh, if you put a category on them, uh, questions that aren't necessarily like fact-based questions, but questions that ask like, how, how come you did this? Try to get an understanding of where that person is coming from. Um, and then I also think, uh, I mean, there, you know, questions are asked to get different things. So it depends also on the context. Like if we're trying to understand, like if we're trying to get to know somebody, uh, you know, the type of questions that you want to ask, at least the type of questions that I would ask are, you know, their background, trying to get a sense of their family. And maybe those are the things that um, I prioritize or I think that's what everybody has some commonality to. So we can all connect in that sense. Uh, if you're trying to get like information or if it's if it's a if it's context like a, a podcast where you want the speaker to speak more, uh, any question that can be um yeah, open-ended. And I also think, I also think unclear questions are good. Um, you know, because you'll ask an unclear question and it's, it's clear enough where they know it's clear enough where they know like the subject that you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, and then sometimes they'll try to kick back and say, um, you know, like, Oh, like, do you mean this? Or do you mean that? And it's like, answer however you want. Either's <laughs> fine. You know? So yep. I think in a sense that, it's just being willing, being willing to be uh, dynamic in the sense of you ask open-ended questions, you ask them clear questions, they answer how they want. They may say something that you weren't expecting and then just being ready to follow up off of what they just shared with you. Yeah. It's almost like a dance sometimes. It's kind of it how is. <laughs> <laughs> so has there ever, I mean, you've done really incredible things. And again, I cannot emphasize enough how many people were coming up to me telling me about you and i have to believe the the, the dot that was connected to me is because you were doing those types of things right <laughs> that you left this positive trail in your wake where like basically it seemed like when people were talking about you that they had basically had the world's best therapy session and they just <laughs> felt like great afterwards and i was like how do you do and i was like how do you do that how do you but has there ever been a, a failure, uh, you know, anywhere along your path that really sticks out in your mind where you're like you, you're not necessarily regret something you're like, man, it would, things would have been a lot easier if I wouldn't have hit that wall. Mm. Well, I mean, I think the, I think the trials of uh, being a second lieutenant in the United States army, uh, platoon leader, very challenging job. And there are a lot of trials uh, in that time period. Like here you are in charge of 28 to 30 individuals. Uh, They're all looking to you, or at least you think they're looking to you. Um, first one, so that I think they're mostly looking to the platoon sergeant, and <laughs> the platoon sergeant really knows uh, the job. But um, and I think I realized that in the sense of, hey, I just need to listen to my platoon sergeant. Uh, but I think we put this uh, hidden pressure on ourselves that you know you are in charge and you are the face of whatever formation you're in, whether that's the platoon formation or at least representing the officer corps. So there were just trials that I, I had faced in that environment as, uh, in general, whether it was leading a uh, a convoy mission where, you know, you had to plan a convoy for the entire unit um, and a hiccup would come up, you know, someone would take a wrong turn uh, and you always look back and say like, was the briefing not clear? Um, another example would be when I was applying for the army's law school program in that time period, I didn't get in the very first time. And uh, that was, that was an experience that, was was a little bit, I wouldn't necessarily say it wasn't painful, but 
it almost looked it, it almost made you seem as if like the dreams and the the goals that you've been working for for so long like may never materialize yeah um and what was interesting thing an interesting thing about that was when i didn't get in um i also had to move duty locations to another duty location to fort bliss you know from jblm washington all the way to el paso texas so there's a lot of like interesting things going on in your life at that time. It's like you didn't get into the program and then a month yeah. later, you're, you know, you're shipping off to El Paso. Um, but I think in that, like, I, I wouldn't call them failures because I look back and I say that was great experience. You know, like, yeah. I learned a lot. I was able to mature from it. Um, I just look, I look at those as experiences um, and I'm thankful for them because, you know, had I gone to law school at the age uh, that I initially wanted to go to, I'm not quite sure if I would have been mature for it. Um, so the way things worked out, the timing of, them, the experiences, the setbacks, um, they were all good. So let's talk about law school for a minute, if you're willing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> because, because I, th- I think that you're, you're right. And this is, again, our, our stories are so parallel. I don't typically draw this many connections, but when you're going through law school, is there anything through that experience that, that really shifted in your mind within that? What, you know, either how you did things or, you know, what was your takeaway? I love the law school, Carson. So, and people think I'm crazy for saying that. But <laughs> I, I certainly do, but <laughs> I had a, I had a blast in law school and uh, that was for many reasons, but I think my takeaway from from law school is one that reaffirmed my passion for uh, community service and, and helping out an environment. Uh, Gonzaga's mission uh, of social justice and giving back to community jived well with me. Uh, so I appreciated going to that school uh, and, and having that type of experience. From a personal development standpoint, just being well versed in, in the law, as, as much as you can say, I mean, law school teaches you uh, in, in a sense, the, the basics of a specific subject, uh, until you practice it, you're not going to really have a very good idea, or even if it's a subject that you're going to like, but at least in terms of, uh, or a subject that you're going to like practicing in, but in terms of at least from an academic perspective, uh, law school just does a phenomenal job in at least introducing to you to that. And then in terms of like my own growth, we all hear the stories of how law school is challenging and you're experiencing that right now. <laughs> But once you finish it, you know, you look back and you say, man, like, I I did it. We did it, you know, as a class, uh, individually. So anything that any hill or any milestone that you're able to achieve that I'm able to achieve, when I look at the next, you know, hill that you would need to take or the next milestone that is up for the taking, whether it's um, a course or, or whatnot, you just look back at those past experiences. So it gave a lot of confidence. Um, and it just reaffirmed this belief because, you know, for you, Carson, your military experience, law school, yeah. um, you know, the way that you've conducted this podcast and, you know, just some of the past episodes that I've listened to, uh, you're, you know, you, you just have a trajectory of, of success. And I think, it, it, I think it's tough when you put yourself in a law school environment because you get beat up, you know, you, you know, you're, you're doing great, but, you know, teachers say, oh, you know, it could be better. So like, in the moment you feel as if your confidence is hit. But when you look at the collective picture of all the things going on, when I look at the collective picture, it's like, not so bad, you know? So, and I think that's what I got out of law school and that's what I took out of it. Um, In addition to the relationships, in addition to the friends, uh, in addition to um, just seeing the, I wouldn't necessarily say the impact, but just seeing how much, just staying engaged, right? Like if I stayed engaged in the law school and, I think I personally learned more from people than I think I ever could have had I have not just approached it from the way that I did. If I just looked at it from an academic perspective, like I'm just going to go to class, get the grades that I want, you know, that I want, that I hope to get, um, as opposed to trying to develop those relationships. So uh, I, I'd say the last would be the power of being intentional in developing relationships. Yeah. Were there any surprising relationships or maybe, you, you know, cause you run into this in the military too, where you're like never in a million years would I have met and hung out with that person. But here we are in the, uh, you know, this really challenging environment together. And this person right. is just fantastic. Do you have any of those? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I mean, I think just from a personality standpoint, 
I, I, I appreciate the inclusiveness and trying to be as inclusive as possible. I think that's just been my, my MO as far as I can remember. So a lot of the relationships that I, I wanted to focus on in law school, or at least I, I think I was more conscientious of were the individuals that seemed to almost be on the, uh, on the outskirts of groups. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know how law school works and just how social relationships works. There's always, there's always, there are always groups. They're always in crowds. They're always, um, you know, collections of people. And then you always have the ones or twos uh, on the side. And I, I think it's just so important. And I, I wanted to make it a point. To, and it wasn't, you know, there was no like gameism out of it. It was just, <laughs> I, you know, I've been that person as well yeah. in, in different areas of my life. Um, so it was just being intentional about making sure that they were included as well. Uh, because law school is a lonely process. I mean, it's not there's not a lot of collaborative collaboration going on in law school. It's, yeah. you know, you take the exam by yourself. There aren't very many group projects. Um, so I wanted to do the best that I could to ensure that they felt included. Um, so whatever relationships were developed out of that without, um, uh, I guess, getting too much into the, uh, like the context of like who they were as a person, but there are certainly people that um, weren't necessarily well connected to people, but wanted to make sure that they, uh, I felt like they, they were connected. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, you were voted to give a speech at your graduation, weren't, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. That I think manifests the, the reality that that's exactly what you were doing. Because it, I don't think that it's by accident that I heard your name so much. So many people talked about you and that your peers decided to have you do that. Because I think a lot of veterans um, were getting out feel like they kind of are on the outside looking in a lot right and i think you're a perfect example of how that intentional development cultivation of that manifests itself and they that they put you up on the pedestal literally and had you speak to them you know <laughs> i just thought that was absolutely fascinating um so what would you give what, what advice would you give to somebody who is ambitious and driven but maybe feels a little stuck and i'm thinking about veterans who are now in the civilian world what would you tell them as your number one piece of advice if they feel like they're on the outside looking in? So the the transition from the military to the better to the civilian community is is a tough one for for many reasons. Uh, I currently have many uh, colleagues and mentors right now in uh, in the army at. You know, 25th Infantry Division is a unit that I'm assigned to. There are many people getting ready to get out. And when you when you talk to them, they're excited about the retirement. Yeah. But they are uneasy about the transition. So mm -hmm. like retirement's the first step, like you've reached a milestone, you've reached 20, 25 years and they're excited. And then they also recognize that there's going to be a transition. It's almost like the second phase, transitioning to another style of living and many of them are young enough that they want to continue on working i think the fear that they have is they only been in the military that's the only job that they've ever had since whether they're 17 18 years old or straight out of college uh, and there is a belief and i don't necessarily know if it's entirely accurate but there is a belief that there's a different, um, they are different environments, the civilian environment when it comes to working in corporate America versus um, the United States military, whatever branch that is. They certainly have different cultures about them, but I think that the, the traits that you develop in the military are, are only going to serve you well in the civilian side, whether it's uh, you know, the values that you develop, loyalty, discipline, um, respect, like the military instills that into you. Um, so there, there, there should be a, a heightened sense of, of confidence, uh, not arrogance, because I think yeah. when, yeah. when individuals transition, there may be this form of like entitlement, and then that never bodes well on the civilian side. But there should be an assurance that, you know, you've done a phenomenal thing, only, you know, less than 1% of 
uh, the individuals in our nation take the call to join the military. So there should be this sense of confidence. When you do join the civilian side, um, you may feel as if you're the outside looking in. I don't entirely think that should be the case. I, yeah. I know it does happen, but I think it may just be an awareness of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a worker. I've always been a worker. Um, it's learning the ways in which this environment operates. Um, and it's just seeing where I can add value to this organization. Uh, military crafts find individuals to be able to do that within our own environment. Uh, and I feel like that level of skill set when you're in the civilian side is easily translatable. So um, I hope that's not like <laughs> punting the question, but I, I, I want to believe that in the transition because, I mean, I can relate to that as well. I mean, I was in, I was in for four years before I went to law school, but I never saw much of a shift. There's certainly certain like practices, right? Like in the military, you know, you can tell a soldier to do something uh, and they'll do it, right? Like you can tell uh, a Marine to do something and they'll do it. Um, you know, the tone in which you, you operate may be a little bit different, but the end result will always be the same. Organizations always want to get better. Uh, they always want their employees to be that value added to their organization. Um, so if you're the outside looking in, it would be to, in a sense, reconstruct your mind to believe that, hey, yeah, I'm in this new environment. It's not entirely different from the military. Like they all want the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and approaching it from a position of, of listening and watching how to operate in this environment before uh, going forward. I, I think that may be the best, the best advice that I'd give. Yeah, that's actually, James Manis said something very similar when I asked him that question. He talks about listening a lot. And I think in order to listen, you got to ask questions. Right. And, and I, that's so, so pivotal. So along this time frame, you've been, you've been putting all this output out into the world. You've been going through this, but you, I have to imagine that you're making investments in yourself, whether it's monetary time or energy, what investments do you, do you put into yourself to keep your battery full for all of this stuff that you work on? So in terms of personal investments, um, nothing beats one, the relationships that you develop, like for you, like the guests that you have on your show, like mm -hmm. having general math is on your show. Incredible. <laughs> And um, just being able to have that as a resource and learning from him. Um, I mean, not so many people can, can get that opportunity. So in terms of investments from, like the, from the podcast perspective, you're getting access to a subject matter expert in this field uh, and having relationships with them. It doesn't just stop mm -hmm. at the end of the show. Like you have your contact information. They say things. Uh, you always will have that question answer relationship with them where they see you as somebody who's inquisitive. Um, so the knowledge that you gain from these interactions are always an investment that will pay off dividends somewhere down the road, right? Like yeah. the, the typical, the, or the perfect example that I have is, and, and one of my, one of my favorite shows, one of the favorite shows that I had on, um, on spotlight was the criminal procedures, uh, dual, dual, uh, dual episode and what we did on that show was uh, we had professor uh, mary pat Schuhart, and she's a criminal procedures instructor uh she gave the perspective of the citizen when it came to being pulled over by a police officer uh phenomenal episode very insightful uh the, the very next episode we had a police officer come on uh and he confirmed many of the things about professor Schuhart. this professor uh this a uh, police officer, his name is, his name is Anthony Bandero. Um, and, you know, he's written extensive literature on criminal procedures from a police officer's perspective. So you have these two shows and they're providing insightful guidance on uh, the criminal procedures practice of, you know, search authorizations, warrants, um, I took it for what it was, you know, I, I gained information out of that episode, both episodes, not knowing that a year later, 
and the judge advocate court, they'll have me be a military magistrate, where essentially that is what I'm doing. You know? yeah. And I, I reach back to those experiences. I reach back to both individuals um, from time to time, and we have discussions um, amongst many things. But you never know what information you're going to get from uh, any conversation from these yeah. podcasts uh, and seeing how that is going to apply in the future. But when that does when that time does come, you can always reach back to those experiences that you had. So I see just any knowledge gained is a personal investment um, for me. And then also learning from people as well. I mean, uh, here, here are two people um, with, with a podcast and, you know, I'm learning something from you in the way that uh, in your technique and your, your question format as well. So every interaction is a learning experience. Uh, and I see that as that personal investment. Yeah, I think that's a phenomenal point because it, some of the payoffs are huge, right? And uh, I, I'd just like to take a moment to share that just because we're on the topic. Uh, getting General Mattis was not because of any of my efforts necessarily. It's because somebody else I had gone and had a conversation with at the law school was a dean at the law school. I was like, hey, here's what I'm trying to do. And, you know, I had helped them with other things. I had done like a, like a one page little worksheet on like how to tie a tie for them, right? That was <laughs> it. That was it. And then the net result was that that person went and tracked down the other people that I needed to get General Mass to come on the show. Wow. I had never met him or talked to him before I had sat down with him to do that show. And I just think that that's such an important point to hammer home. And I'm glad that you brought it up because... I think sometimes the temptation is to draw back when you're uncertain. And I, I think that's a great point, Ben, such a great Thanks. point. So we're, you know, we're, I don't want to take too much here. We're doing this on a Saturday for those of you who won't know that, but <laughs> is there, are there any last pieces of advice that you'd really like to impart to people that maybe you have, I haven't dug into yet? So, yeah, one of the, um, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. And I wrote this one down uh, for you just so I got it right. It, it comes from a poem. And, it, and I, I think it just ties back to uh, a lot of the, the themes that we've discussed today. The, uh, the poem is called Desiderata. Uh, you may have heard of it. And there's a line in the poem that, in a sense, has driven... Uh, and should drive, I think, a lot of individuals, how, how they operate with people. And, and I'll read the text to you, uh, and then I guess you can go from there. So uh, it reads, uh, speak your truth quietly and clearly, and listen to others, even to the dull and the ignorant. They, too, have a story to tell. And I think that it is so important, especially in the legal field, where at times we're operating at a speed that we may not be able, or at least it appears we may not be able to give people our full attention. Mm -hmm. uh, but every conversation, every individual that we come across, uh, you may talk to them for 10 minutes and eight minutes of that conversation may just be completely uh, useless to you. Um, but again, it's not always about what we can get from those relationships. It's you know how we can make that other person feel. Um, so giving that person that time, uh, and who knows, you know, just having that conversation, they'll be able to share something that is uh, totally insightful that may, you know, change the way we ourselves may think. So that would be the advice that I'd give people uh, and leave off with. Yeah, that, that's a great piece of advice. It actually reminds me of a piece of advice that my seventh grade speech teacher, this man, uh, Tyrone Wilkerson, fantastic, fantastic guy. And he was more, he taught us a lot about speech, but I would say he was a, my, uh, uh, a philosopher in his own right. But he used to say to <laughs> us something very similar. He said, no person is completely worthless. Yeah. Even, even a bad person can be a bad example, right? Mm -hmm. And, that, and I, that's something that I've internalized. And when, as soon as you read that, I was like, oh, that sounds just like what Tyrone used to say. <laughs> so that's fantastic. And, you know, man, thanks so much for coming on. I'm glad we finally got to have a moment because we've been emailing back and forth just to, to talk and, you know, compare notes. Thanks, Carson, and thanks for having me on the show, man. Uh, it was a true honor, and uh, truly delighted to meet you, finally. <laughs> yeah.
Hey everyone, thanks again for listening to another episode of the Spotlight Podcast. And I just wanted to take a second to ask you who you think should be interviewed on the show. Who do you think is out there that's just absolutely crushing it that the veteran population needs to hear from? That's what we want to hear from you. Send us your suggestions to spotlight at the Zen Veteran. Dot com. That's S-P-O-T-L-I-G-H-T at thezenveteran.com. Thanks again for listening.